Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Jessica McDonald. I'm a knitting pattern designer and this is my podcast all about knitting. We have kind of a really, really full day today. I have only one single work in progress to show you. No finished objects or anything. But a few days ago I asked on Instagram, I was like, I want to talk about circular yokes. Put any question you have or any topic you want me to talk about concerning circular circular yokes into the question box and I got a ton of questions. So there's gonna be a lot today. I think we're gonna have actually a bit of a packed episode. I thought it would only be like 20 minutes of me talking about one sweater, but I think we're gonna be talking for quite a while today. If you've been around for a while, you know I can talk for a long time about today. So if you are new here, welcome. I'm very glad you're here. If you are a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back and listening to me again. I really love that so many of you enjoy knitting while you listen to me prattle on about knitting. So today is Sunday, October 2nd, I think. Look, Sunday, October 2nd. And um, yeah, this is today's podcast. So, my only work in progress. We'll start with that one. Uh, I'll start with my only work in progress and I'll kind of segue into answering all of the questions as I talk about it. And then at the end, I'll talk about all the rest of the questions which are on my notepad right here in front of me um, that I didn't cover whilst I was talking about this yoke. I've got a whole pile of yoke sweaters, not all of them because I have a lot and some are in need of a bath, but today all about yoke sweaters and color work and yeah, it's gonna be so much fun. I suppose before we begin I should start with what I'm wearing. This is the silver birch pullover. It is currently available in my forest print book and ebook. The, the pre-order period for the print book ended yesterday because the books are going to be arriving to me sometime this week, probably later this week or maybe even early next week, not quite sure of the day. You can see back here in the background, I have 400 mailers. <laughs> I am gonna use mm, probably mm, close to all of them. I will probably have about 50 left over when I'm done packing all of your pre-orders. I've sold like 350 books. This box here, the bigger one, is a larger size, so people who ordered multiple books like if they ordered a copy of Forest and Woodland Ramble, they can go in the same mailer. And then these other four boxes, whoops, where's my finger? Over here, those are just for single books. And yeah, sold about 350 of them. So thank you so much to everybody who bought them. Let me show you my whole outfit. I am getting really disconnected. I'm sorry, I'm really excited about my book. <laughs> this is my whole outfit for the day. Move the chair. The focus didn't get completely messed up. This is a mama dress from Not Perfect Linen in the emerald green colorway, and I've just got silver birch layered over top of it, like so. It's not actually that cold today, but I'm wearing it anyway because it's October. Um, since it's Sunday, I'm in a dress. I always wear a dress to church. I can't. I can't wear jeans, even though I do go to a non-denominational church, and many of the ladies there their pants. I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. I was raised a bit more old fashioned than most people are. And I just like, uh, my grandmother would be so ashamed of me right now. So I was wearing a dress or a skirt. Anyway. Now shall we talk about my sweater? We went to Yellowstone National Park we got back eight days ago. So we went to Yellowstone National Park for my 35th birthday, which was a week ago yesterday. And I started this sweater, I told you, I told you about how I was gonna start this sweater and blow through the yoke before we left, but I didn't. I was knitting on the yoke the whole time we were there um, in the park. And if you follow me on Instagram, you will have seen a number of photos and videos and reels and stuff that I took actually in the park. 
Um, and if you want to see my Instagram uh, account, I'll have a li there's a link for it in the description box below. I'm really bad at the start of a podcast. Um, you can also sign up for my newsletter in the description box below. Find my patterns at links in the description box below. Maybe one of these days I'll actually script out an actual intro and say all these things in the front, but until then I'll be a very bad podcaster. So this is the grown up fletching. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna go get the kid version of this. Hang on, I'm back. This may come as no surprise to some of you watching, but sometimes I wonder if I have ADHD because I can't get really distracted. Anyway, so this is the children's fletching. It has been stuffed rather unceremoniously into a drawer in the dresser in Aiden's room. He outgrew it last winter and um, it's just been in there. <laughs> but this is little fletching. I think this is the 18 month size. I'm not entirely sure anymore what size I made because I made this quite a while ago. Maybe it's the one year size. It's either a year or 18 month size, but it is a cute little colorwork sweater with this really simple colorwork motif. I think the three month size, yeah, the three month size has only one of these repeats because the yoke's not deep enough to accommodate more. And then most of the kid sizes has two of the bands, and then the older kid sizes have three of the bands. It's another one of these coming back around. So this is the children's fletching. It is a very popular pattern. A lot of people really, really love it. Um, it's really simple to knit and it just has a really simple look to it, but it's just really, really attractive. And it has kind of a Norwegian vibe, maybe more of a Scandinavian vibe, like something you would see on a toddler in a store in Denmark, you know? So this is the kids version. And ever since, like literally ever since I finished this pattern, I have received regular questions from people asking me to do an adult version. So this is the adult version. And uh, finally, at long last, for people who have been waiting for a very long time, it's finally here. So this is the adult version. As you can see, it has the exact same color work as the baby version, the kid version. It's the exact same color work. Um, it's just more of it. So both of these, both are knit in Barrett Wool Co. Woolens. It's a sport weight yarn. I really like Barrett Wool Co. Um, you might be familiar with Susan B. Anderson. It's her yarn line. It's her yarn company that she runs with her son. So this is from a mill in somewhere in the Midwest. I don't know exactly where, but they get um, wool, I think they source their wool, all their wool from the Midwest as well, and then spin it in the Midwest. And she lives in Wisconsin, so it's all from the Midwest of the United States. And yeah, it's a really nice yarn. It is, if you're looking for something super duper soft, this isn't your yarn. I wouldn't describe it as particularly itchy. There is a little bit of crunchiness to it and a little bit of prickle to it, but like, I can put it on my neck here and it's fine. Like this is my most sensitive part of my body here and I can, like it's fine. It doesn't feel like, it feels a bit wooly, but it doesn't feel bothersome. It's not gonna cause me issues. It's not gonna be uncomfortable to wear. But this is a really, really nice yarn and I especially love how the gray that I chose is a little bit heathered. I'm not gonna focus on it because it'll mess up my focus and then my face will be blurry. I'm not sitting with an arm's length of the screen. So it is a little bit heathered and which I really love a gray that's a little bit heathered. The main color I'm using is Thimble. This is Thimble. And then the contrast color I'm using is Old Fashioned. Yes, Old Fashioned. So I bought two balls of this. I have another whole complete ball. I did not use very much of the contrast color. But this color is a really nice autumnal color and everything matched really well with everything that's turning beautiful and golden and it's fall. So this is the big fletching. I'm just calling it big fletching, which isn't a very 
it isn't very it's not a very catchy name I don't think because it like the little version is called fletching because it looks kind of like the fletching on an arrow I'm like I should just call this one big fletching as well even though it's not the most interesting name maybe anyway this one is perfect for someone who wants really simple color work or is a beginner level. This is the inside. Um, I'm showing you it's got really, really short floats. It's really, really simple. The entire repeat is just two main color, two contrast color repeated all the way around the yoke. And then you just shift it a little bit to make the little feathers. So it's really simple. It's really easy. And it was really enjoyable to knit. I could knit it in the car while we were driving because it's just really simple color work. So I really didn't even have to look while I knit. You don't have a lot of work managing the floats because they're only two stitches long each one. So that's really easy to manage. So it's really simple, really easy, and looks really beautiful. I am flying through the body. I'm now just past eight inches. Um, I split for sleeves sometime this week, middle of the week. I am racing to get this one done before the leaves are gone. So when I look this way, I'm looking out the window. The camera is on my desk and the window's immediately behind it. So the trees down here in the river are well on their way to being golden. They're probably 30% yellow and the rest green and I'm really really wanting to take pictures of this one with the fall colors with the golden leaves I think it would be stunning especially because it looks like golden leaves so I'm racing to get it done weekend after next we should be able to like next weekend it's not going to be done so I'm planning weekend after next we're going to go take the pictures of it and so I need to finish the body and the sleeves before then so I timed how long it takes me to knit a single round and then I divided it up so if I knit the whole body in one week I have to knit about three inches a day which is about 28 rounds and it takes me I think it was like six and a half or seven minutes to knit a round so I have to knit for two and a half hours a day so I finished the body in time and then I have to bang out a couple of sleeves. So I'm really knitting fast and furious and uh, hopefully I can get it done in time because I really, really, really want to take pictures with the fall colors because it would be beautiful. So hopefully by the time I come back and film another episode, this will be a finished object. This is my only knitting I have to show you this. This time it's literally the only thing I've knit on since the last time we've talked. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the questions. I have them all written here on my notebook in front of me. My husband was making fun of me earlier because I got this app called Freedom to help me waste less time on Instagram. And I set it so it blocks Instagram from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. every single day. So I can't end and begin my days on Instagram. And I also scheduled it to block it all day on Sunday. And then before I came up here to record, I was like, all of these questions are on Instagram, on my stories archive, and I can't get into Instagram. And he was making fun of me for that because I blocked Instagram and then I needed to get in there to find all my questions. I was able to end a session, which you can end three sessions before you have to call customer service. They, they, are, they know what their job is. If you could just end a session whenever, it obviously wouldn't work, so. I'm having better Instagram boundaries these days, thanks to the Freedom app. But I got into Instagram and I got all my questions, so now I'm gonna go through the questions. So, the first one I'm gonna answer is, are my patterns in Spanish? My patterns are only in English. Um, I, Someday perhaps I will have my patterns translated, but right now I'm kind of over my head in everything and that's additional admin to find a translator, work with the translator to get the patterns translated and then upload all the 
translated versions of them. I don't think I have the time right now to manage that kind of a task. Someday I would like to have them translated, but I, I just, um, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of time and so I'm trying to focus on creating new patterns. So I'm sorry, they're all in English. However, I do know that a lot of people who don't speak English are able to follow my patterns. I have one test knitter who doesn't speak a word of English and we just communicate with uh, Google Translate and she's able to uh, understand my patterns well enough. She's probably pretty familiar with knitting terminology and you can also just copy paste sections into Google Translate, see what they say, if you're working from a digital copy of the PDF. Um, so those are, ca those are workarounds and I'm sorry I don't have them translated but that's not going to happen for a while. Sorry. Now let's get into talking about circular yokes. So a lot of people asked how I take my inspiration and turn it into a circular yoke. That really varies quite wildly. So here is, oh, Ruska needs a bath. It's all right guys, I'm showing you a dirty sweater. This is Ruska. Ruska was inspired on a day that, this was quite a few years ago, I still remember the exact moment of inspiration, but this was when Talia was five and she was going to public kindergarten, so I had to drive her to school every day, which I hated and it was awful. But there was a fall day, sometime in October, and it was rainy, and so the mountains were all black because they were wet and it was cloudy and it was still pretty early in the morning, and that was all black. And there was a lot of gray from the rain and the clouds, and then all over the mountains, every little pocket of aspens was just bright yellow, and they really stood out really well on that day. And that was the inspiration for Ruska. Does it look like mountains? It originally was going to have like mountain peaks with little pockets of yellow in it and I bought this yarn, the colors of the yarn, specifically to match that color palette of the gray, the light gray and the nearly black and then the yellows for the pop of color. All of these colors were chosen based off of that inspiration but instead of trying to actually create mountains in the motif I just decided to take all of these different Shetland knitting motifs and put the colors together because in Shetland knitting you can put colors together like like you only use two colors per round but you kind of change out the background colors a little bit and change out the colors so that you have this nice multicolored effect. Um, so I decided to do that so you have all these colors mingled in with each other. So it's the same color from the inspiration, but it's not the actual physical image of the inspiration. Does that make sense? <laughs> so that's one way I take an inspiration and put it into a yoke. Because it doesn't have to be the exact thing. You can just take like, when we were in Yellowstone, everywhere it was like kind of straw yellow and the stone color of the old wood, you know, that, that weathered white wood look from the boardwalks and the old dead fallen trees and then pops of rust and pops of yellow and all that. Instead of trying to make a boardwalk with a yellow plant next to it, I could just take that color, that color inspiration and put it into a sweater with a different motif. Or, there's a bed right here, so I'm tossing it onto the bed. I am not super nice with my sweaters, but I don't horrendously use them. Or there's this one, so this is Snowy Pines, and the inspiration for this sweater was literally snow falling on a forest. So here you have snow falling on a forest, right here. But I couldn't fit that in the whole yoke, so like that's the upper part, I feel really weird doing this, but that's you know, from here up, is the snow falling on the forest, but then where do you go from there? Because you can't, uh, that would have been kind of funny looking to stop here. I think you needed more. So then I added in this 
graphic color work to punch up the yolk and fill it out. So the, the inspiration doesn't necessarily take over the whole thing. It sometimes is just the starting point. So that's how I did that inspiration. But the color is here, like the green of the forest and the white of the snow and gray because you should put gray in everything, right? So that's another place where, you know, the, the inspiration of snow falling on a forest ended up in this yoke. Or we can go another direction. This is Blizzard. A lot of people have been buying Blizzard lately. Here's Blizzard. This did not start with any particular inspiration. This started from a, a different place. So a lot of my knitting in the past has been I start with my inspiration and I make what I want. And I don't really think about um, aiming that yoke at a certain skill level or for a certain group of people like this is what I want to make it is what it is if it suits you there you go but this one started from wanting to create a color work yoke that works perfectly for somebody who's never knit color work before the entire purpose of this sweater is to have an attractive yoke that somebody who's never knit color work before can knit color work. That was the whole purpose behind this yoke. Every motif that I've put into here, I wanted them to look good together, but every single motif that I put into here had to follow a few little rules, like very short floats, easily memorized repeat. So it's only four stitch repeat that you have to remember for any of the sections. So that, those were the requirements for this yoke. That's a little bit different from taking an inspiration and then putting it into a yoke. Like the, the inspiration for this one is just snow, just snow in a sweater. And this one didn't start with any particular inspiration like that. It just came from a place of wanting to serve a certain group of knitter. The knitter who doesn't know how to knit color work wants to learn how to knit color work and really wants to make themselves a color work yoke sweater. This one was made to serve that group of people. Specifically. I, I think it's beautiful. I wear my blizzard all the time. And a lot of people have been buying blizzard lately so it looks like there are a lot of people who want to learn how to knit color work. This one's also accompanied by a whole how to knit color work tutorial. The sun is coming out so I'm gonna glow from the light reflecting off my table for a few minutes. So that was, that was the start of this yoke. Or there's another thing where, here's red cedar. This one started from, so this, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of cedar, the children's version, because this one is just the grown up version of that. So when I was making Woodland Ramble, I had all I had the other three sweaters picked out, like the designs were all set and colors were picked out, everything was kind of set in stone for the other three sweaters. And then for the fourth sweater, I wanted to create a color work sweater that brought all of the colors of the collection, because see, it's got all the different colors in it, all the colors of the collection into one place. And I also wanted it to be simpler. So hang on, grab my sweater again. Snowy Pines, or the children's version of this, which is called Ponderosa, is a little bit harder to do. The floats are a little bit longer, and there are there are a few rounds where you have to knit with three colors. I don't remember how many rounds, it's not a ton. There's some rounds where you need to knit with three colors. Knitting with three colors, in my mind, bumps it up to a more complicated color work pattern. So this one, Snowy Pines, or Ponderosa, was a more complicated color work sweater. So I wanted the other color work sweater to be simpler, a lot simpler. So I wanted to keep the motifs at the beginning a little bit simpler. I only wanted to, the, there to be two colors in any round. I didn't want any rounds with three colors. And I kind of wanted it to be really simple in the top, kind of smaller motifs, and then build to something big and impactful on the bottom. So I found this star motif that I decided would be perfect for the bottom. 
And then I found all these other motifs up here and I split them up with this really simple two by two column repeat to keep it simple. So that's, that's where red cedar came from. So some like snowy pines and ponderosa start from a place of taking the inspiration and putting it in as pure, as purely as I can into a yoke. And some of them start in a different place, a place where I'm trying to make a sweater that fulfills a need or fills a gap in a collection or um, kind of rounds things out. My camera died on me there, but that was a fairly decent stopping point at which it decided to go. So I think I talked about inspiration in color work yokes for long enough. Now we're gonna talk about, uh, well, another question I got from somebody is, what are circular yokes? Circular yokes are when you knit a color work yoke. And the reason it's called a circular yoke is because you are, it's possible to show probably, you are quite literally knitting a circle. <laughs> this is really funky to try to show you. You are quite literally knitting a circle until you split for the sleeves. So the entire yoke, as you're knitting it, it's just a circle you start with the neck and it just grows out from there and the whole thing is just a circle. So that's why they're called circular yokes. Now we're going to talk about the spacing of the increases. This is when I'm knitting, when I'm designing a colorwork sweater, determining the spacing of the increases is the thing that takes up almost all of my time. So in a colorwork yoke sweater, you start at the neckline, or if you're knitting bottom up, you start bigger and shrink, but I'm gonna talk about this in the perspective of a top-down yoke, because that's how I do all of mine. You start small at the neckline, and then you increase your way out to the bottom of the yoke. How I determine how many increases I need is I take how many stitches I need to get the next circumference that I want, then I figure out how many stitches I need for the bottom of the yoke, and that is the chest circumference plus both upper sleeves minus all of the underarm stitches that will be added. Um, so that gives me the top of the yoke, bottom of the yoke. The difference between the two is the number of increases that I need to put into the yoke. Given that I start all of my sweaters with the same size neckline, even on up into plus sizes, since people's necks don't really get much bigger as people's chests get bigger, I keep the neck lines pretty much the same. Um, so the smaller sizes will need fewer increases than the larger sizes. So I have to take all of those increases for all of the different sizes and I have to fit them into the motif somewhere, somehow. But not only that, the rates of the increases need to be done in such a way that the yoke lays nice. So if I put too many at the top, you don't have the body to use up that fabric yet. Or if I leave them to way too low, then your body needs more room before the increases create extra fabric. So both of those issues will result in a yoke that doesn't fit well. So if you do too many increases too soon at the top, you can end up with a rumply yoke. If you do the increases too low down, you'll end up with a yoke where it's just constantly trying to shove itself up because there's not enough room for the shoulders so it's constantly trying to ride up so you have to do it at the right rate um yeah what is the right rate well that depends a lot of the advice that i read when i was first designing circular yokes say to do it in three rounds three increase rounds as you're going through the sweater one right after the neckline one a little bit in and then another one about middle of the yoke and you want to increase at a faster rate nearer the neckline so this would be a quicker rate than the other two rounds i don't generally do just three uh, rounds of increases i will do quite a few rounds of increases actually um in the big fudgy there are i actually haven't tried this sweater on yet there are, let me get my pattern out. I can't remember if it's five or six. Hang on, hang on. So there are six increase rounds 
for the larger sizes, but there's only five for the smaller sizes. So that's five to six increased rounds in the yolk of this one. Of big fletching. I can't remember how many rounds of increased rounds I put into snowy pines or any of the other ones for that matter. If I, I knit this last winter, so it's been a while. But usually I have four or five increased rounds. I do more than the recommended three. To do all of those increases over three rounds, um, I don't think that's an even enough distribution of increases. I think you're trying to put too many increases in too few rounds. And I don't like how that works out. So I generally do more increased rounds. Um, when you're doing increase rounds, basically do them at a faster rate at the top of the sweater and then at a slower rate as you move down the sweater. You don't want to do too many up towards the neck, but you also don't want to leave, <laughs> leave them to too low near the bottom. Yes, it's a little bit complicated. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of an art, really. You take the math of the number of increases that you need and you have to fit it in the color work somewhere and you have to fit it in somewhere where you don't notice it and it has to fit nicely. And placing the increase rounds, when I'm building a chart, placing the increase rounds into the motif. So like as I was placing the increase rounds into this motif, um, that's one of the things I spend most of my time on when I'm creating the chart is where to put the increase rounds and how to create the color work motif in such a way that it flows seamlessly through all of the increases in the yoke. So like here you can see, so I did the neckline and then I did an immediate increase round and that's before the color work even began. And then, do, 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 right there. The first increase round is down here, it's right here at the beginning of this, so this little peak has to grow to accommodate it. And then there's another increase round here. So it's got to grow a little bit more to accommodate that. And then you come down here and towards the bottom of the tree, there's another increase round here. And then you come down, I don't, there's another increase round here, I think. I'm trying to read my knitting. No, I don't. I don't think so. I'm trying to tell where I put all the increases. There's not one there. So you have to, I have to make it in such a way where you're kind of in a, in a background where you're putting the increases and that you won't really notice that that is growing. Like if I put an increase round just in this gray part, it's, I'm being lit from below again. It's the, uh, it's the reflection of the sun off my table. We'll just see if that, if that helps. We'll put a sweater over top of it. Is that better? <laughs> so I have to put the increases in a creative place so that you don't notice them when you look at the yoke. But I also have to put them spaced at a reasonable rate, at a reasonable depth in the yoke. This, that's not something that you can explain the whole how to do this just in a few minutes. It would be like a whole intensive course to fully explain um, handling the increases in the yoke. And yeah, it is it's a lot easier to do the increases in a yoke like this where there are plain bands between the color work because all of the increases are just in these plain bands these plain main color bands. You don't have to deal with um, placing the increases inside a motif. You just have to make sure, so this is worked over a stitch count of four, you just have to make sure you have the right number of increases so that every single section is divisible by four or by whatever stitch count your motif is worked over. So it's a lot easier to do the increases in a sweater that has breaks between the color work than it is to put in a yoke where the whole thing is color work and you just have to fit them in there somewhere. So, thoughts about the increases in the yokes. Um, 
Just trust the designer. <laughs> Plug for my own work. It is a lot of work to design a colorwork yoke sweater. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, it, even though it is such a simple shape. In order to get the fit of the yoke right and to have it look good, have the whole all the color work look good and all the motifs to flow well together, it takes a lot of work to put it together. So next up, we're talking about um, some plus sized issues. So plus size alterations to eliminate bat wings. And what I understand this question to mean, I, I message back and forth a little bit, is there's too much fabric in the underarm right here. So when you make a plus sized sweater, you're not just making the chest bigger and the upper arm bigger, you're also increasing the depth of the yoke a bit. And if you don't get all of that together right, you can end up with too much fabric in the underarm. Um, a knee-jerk reaction to this question is the yoke is too deep. Um, but that might not necessarily be the answer. Another knee-jerk reaction to this is the sizing is put together wrong. Like the upper arm, um, they've got the wrong ratio of upper arm circumference to chest circumference. And there's too much fabric somewhere that isn't being taken up by the body. Or perhaps there's an issue with the amount that's cast on in the underarm. So this is commonly thought of as a throwaway, like the underarm. But let's, let's think about how a yoke sweater works. You start at the neck, and as it goes out over your shoulders, it grows. Because when it comes around this part of your body, it's going outside of your shoulders, across your chest, across your back, this whole area of your body, that's the bottom of the yoke. Then when you split for sleeves, you have to create this section of fabric that goes in the underarm, because you've got show you. You've got the outside of the sleeve, like the whole outside of the sleeve and the chest, like from here to here on the chest and on the back again. You've got that fabric accounted for in the bottom of the yoke. But this whole section of your body under your arm is not accounted for in the bottom of the yoke. So you have to cast on the correct number of stitches in the underarm to make up for that part of your body. So perhaps what's going on here is the designer made the upper arm circumference the right number of stitches for the circumference of the arm, but did the wrong number of underarm stitches. So it's pinching funny and the fabric isn't distributed how it should be around the arm. Um, or perhaps like if there's too few, it'll pull it in weird. Or if there's too many, it will just create too much fabric here and then everything's pushed out from under your arm and then you have extra fabric in the front and the back of your underarm. So perhaps it's the wrong amount of underarm stitches. Um, maybe the yoke is too low. Did I already say that? Maybe the yoke is too low, like the split for the sleeves is too low. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of possible problems here. And um, the woman who asked this question said it was from a, a closed group where it was a Discord group where sharing messages is forbidden. So she couldn't share the original message with me. Um, so I'm trying to brainstorm causes of this issue. I don't know what patterns was uh, relating to. I don't know. I don't know a lot of things here. So I'm just trying to brainstorm um, issues that you might find in a larger sized sweater that um, would cause bat wings right here, little pooches of fabric that you don't really want, it doesn't look right. And uh, you should have your sweater fit right even if you are a plus size person. So those are all my ideas for what the cause might be. Um, I don't really have good solutions for this problem because I don't actually see the pattern in front of me. Some things that you might consider is measure your total 
circumference of your upper arm along with your chest and look at the schematic and see how the sweater fits in the upper arm. Um, figure out how many stitches you're given in the underarm and um, this is kind of, this is a bit more difficult but you might want to adjust the underarm stitches, increase or decrease them to adjust for that being the wrong proportion of stitches. Maybe what you want to do is measure around where the bottom of the yoke would sit, like all the way around your, like if I had my husband come and I just stood here with my arms down and measure around just around my shoulder, my whole body, arms and everything, and figure out what the measurement of the bottom of the yoke would be. And then you can take the gauge and figure out the stitch count that would be and then find the size that has closest to that stitch count and then just redistribute the stitches as you need to in the arms and the body when you come to the sleeve separation instead of following the designer's instruction. That's a lot of math you shouldn't have to do, um, but that's a way that you can customize the sweater to your own body if the size guide that the designer used doesn't work well with your particular body because it's impossible to make a sweater that's going to be a perfect fit on absolutely everybody because all of us have a different body. Some of us, you know, have really big arms. Some of us have really scrawny arms. Some of us have a really large bust. Some of us don't really have anything. So to accommodate for each individual body is impossible for me as a designer. I try to follow a sizing guideline that gives the best fit for as many possible people as I possibly can. But sometimes that doesn't work for everybody. So, I'm sorry about that. Um, sometimes you have to customize your sweater to your own size, which is a more advanced skill, which requires math, which is not something that um, an inexperienced sweater knitter is going to be able to do for a while. Uh, but if you are an experienced sweater knitter, that is an idea. Another idea for if you have, um, if the yoke is too low, if the problem is that the yoke is too low, then you can just shorten that fairly easily because generally the color work ends at a certain point. So the color work ends here and then for the larger sizes to make it a little bit deeper, you would just knit in plain stockinette. And so you'll have a little bit of room there. You could shorten the yoke if that's what your body needs. That could, that could happen quite easily, which segues nicely into our next question, except I've run through another 20 minutes of time. Let me restart my camera. This is apparently going to be really long because I am maybe halfway through my questions. Adjusting yoke, wait, no, let me skip ahead. Fit for a larger bust too tight and the sleeve separation is too low. So when you have a larger bust, generally that largeness, I feel really awkward saying this. I, I, I'm sorry, I feel really awkward. Generally the fullest part of your bust is below where the sleeve separation is going to be. So to have it fit in your bust, but not be too big in your shoulders is a puzzle that you have to figure out. There is a fellow podcaster that I watch, um, Casey Apple of Young Folk Knits. She is in the process of sorting this out for herself. So you can go watch her podcast. I will put a link to her podcast in below. And um, she's figuring that out, um, playing with a yoke sweater to figure out the fit, um, make it perfectly fit her body. So the sleeve separation being too low is a fairly easy thing to solve. Like I just said, generally when you have a color work yoke sweater, the color work ends somewhere that would accommodate the depth of the smaller sizes because the smaller sizes are a bit shallower. So there's generally um, just plain stockinette, just plain main color stockinette after the yoke, the color work yoke is finished. So you can just shorten it. You don't have to follow, you know, 
the designer will recommend a depth, but you can shorten that if you want to. Um, it might take some trial and error to find the perfect spot for yours. I like to split about seven and a half inches deep for my size, seven and a half, eight inches deep. That's where I like to separate. Um, you might also like seven and a half or eight inches, or you might want nine, or you might want six. I don't know the specifics of your body, but six would be pretty short, actually. If you're really, really petite, then you could do six, but I don't think you could get away with six unless you were really petite or a 12 year old. <laughs> um, find a shirt that you really like the fit of or a sweater that you really like the fit of and lay it flat and measure how deep the yoke is, like how deep it is from the top, from the neckline down. That would be kind of hard on like a regular t-shirt, but measure how deep it is to the underarm on that one. Like when you're measuring a circular sweater, you measure down this way and you're measuring down this way. But if you get into a different style of construction, like a set in sleeve and a t-shirt, then you're measuring here. So that's a little bit of a different measurement from here to here versus here to here. So you're gonna have to kind of play around with it a little bit to find the perfect spot for you, but start by measuring a shirt you like the fit of and then knit a sweater to that depth, knit another inch or two, put it onto two needles and try it on and see how you like that fit, if you like that spot. If you want it deeper, rip it back, make it deeper, rip it back, make it shallower. Yes, you're gonna have to rip it back, I'm sorry. You can, you already know that the sleeve separation is too low, so you can start from that point where you know what's too low, so you can move back from there. And it's pretty easy to change where your sleeve separation ends. Um, if it's too tight in the bust, that gets a little more complicated because you need fabric here in the chest, but you don't need it up here in the yoke, you don't need it in the upper yoke, and you don't need it in the back. So an idea, a few ideas I have for that is you can knit some short row shaping in the front of your sweater to make uh, kind of like darts, you know, darts and sewing. You could knit some short row darts in the front side, like this part of your sweater. I don't know the math of that. I don't know how to go about doing that. I can't give you any guidance on that. I just know it's a thing that you can do. I know some designers put short row darts and short row shaping in the front of their sweaters. Um, so I know it's a thing you can do, but I don't know how to do it, which would give you research to do on your own. Um, but that's one option you could do, or you could do increases just to, from your sleeve separation down for a little bit. Like I would put it here just to the front side of the underarm. Just put a little section of increases to give you a little extra fabric in the front. And then down below your bust, you could decrease them down again, which would make your sweater come out and then go back in a little bit to accommodate your bust. Um, that would probably look really funky, just laying the sweater flat. So I would do that and then try it on immediately after moving through that and check to see if it looks really weird or not because it might look really weird. I'm not the best problem solver at um, this problem because I don't have anything. So I don't have this problem. Um, I think probably one of the best options would be to do some short row darts. Um, but like I said, I don't know anything other than the fact that they exist and can be used to solve this problem. Gauge too tight and how to keep it right. So have you tried going up a needle size? Just go up a needle size. Um, from the question, it sounds like the gauge is too tight, like right before the sleeve separation. So if you know you have that issue in that same area of the sweater, you might want to try just using a larger size needle for that one spot and seeing if that solves your problem. I think that would be the easiest way to do it. I was watching Andrea Mowry's I'll Knit If I Want To episode 
uh, her latest, I think it was her latest, I think it was her latest, and she talked about how she was, she was advising someone who was having issues with gauge, and she recommended try a different knitting style, like if you knit continental, try English, or if you knit English, try continental, and see if the switch in styles helps you knit more evenly and solves your gauge issue. So that's another idea you might consider. I don't know if you're willing to do that, um, but that might be another thing to try to keep your gauge um, more even. Um, my sons are watching a show downstairs and I can't recognize what it is. My husband is with them. I'm sorry, I'm very distractible. So that is my idea for the gauge issues. The next issue that I'm going to, the next question I'm going to cover is how to choose colors for color works so that don't blend together. And I did not prepare myself. I'm gonna go grab a bunch of yarn real quick. So the next question on the list is how to choose colors for color works so they don't blend together. Before I begin, I'm going to tell you that I've written a blog post all about this topic. I'm going to put a link to it in the description box below. That one includes a lot of photos that are going to illustrate the things I'm going to tell you about. So I would advise you to go read that blog post in addition to listening to me here. So I have yarn. This is obvious. Apparently my happy color scheme now. So you, can you, I'll just hold it here. Here are three colors of yarn. And you can see kind of on screen, kind of at a glance, that there are three kind of shades from dark to light. And the difference in those shades is the color value of these colors. So color has two parts. There's the value, which is basically the depth of the color, how dark it is, how strong it is, how close to black it would be. And then there's the hue, which is the color, pink, purple, blue, green. So these three together are three different colors. There are also three different color values from light to dark. You have light, medium, and dark over here. You want to have different color values in your colors that you choose. Don't focus too much on the hue, the actual, what we think of as the color itself. Look at the color value of the yarn that you're choosing. You want different color values. So if I took a dark navy blue and a light blue, they could play together in a colorworks sweater perfectly happily. They're the same color in terms of hue, but they're vastly different color values, so they work together. So you're looking for different color values. This actually shows up really well. So these three together would look really good together. Well, these two might be a little too close. In real life, they're, they're not, they're okay. But if you put three colors of different color value in the same sweater, in the same yoke, or in the same whatever color work you're knitting, then they will contrast more strongly with each other. Like if I took, these are the same colors, though it's hard to illustrate, but if I took two different yarns that were the same color value, they would blend together and you wouldn't see any difference between them, which would make your color work motif just disappear. I think I might be able to illustrate that a little better. Um, no, maybe not. Maybe. Oh, maybe this works. So this is kind of a creamy white color and this is light gray. They are different colors, but they are the same color value, so you really can't see any difference between them. So even though they're different colors, if I put them in the color work yoke together, it would look like garbage. You couldn't see anything. You might be able to see some weird distortion, but you wouldn't see a pattern. And 
so you you can't put them together they're too close if you want to do a really low contrast color work you can um, you just have to be really careful that you have just enough contrast that you can see the different colors in the motif but realistically what you want is different color values you could do really high contrast with a light and a dark or you could go with a more muted contrast by picking a dark and a medium um, to go together or in this in this one you can see the color distinctly this is kind of a really it's not white it's nearly white but it's a very light oatmeal and then you have this darker brown like there's not a really stark contrast because they share the same underlying shade of color which is brown it's just you have a really light one and a darker one together so this gives you enough contrast for the color work to stand out really well but the fact that they both share the same shade of color kind of softens it a little bit, if that makes sense. So. Hopefully that answers your question about color work. Hang on, just a minute, another thing. Here's another yoke. Here's Ruska again. You can see here in Ruska, I followed that same, um, that same formula of a light. So the main color here is the light. And then the harvest yellow, the golden color, is the medium. And then the dark gray is the dark color value. So you've got a strong color value, a medium color value, and a light color value. And all together, they play really, really well together. You can see that the medium and the dark play well off each other, and the medium and the light play well off each other. And obviously, the dark and the light are going to play really well together as well. So the color value is the most important thing when it comes to picking your colors that you put together in a sweater. How do you figure out what the color value is? That's kind of a more difficult question. Grab your phone. I'm not gonna show you because it's, well, maybe I will. Grab your phone, take a picture. It might look funny because you're taking it on your lap. Take a picture, then you edit it unlock your phone and you edit it and you the um, I'm on an iPhone so on the very bottom in a direct center is three different shades of gray bubbles that's like you can put a filter on it and you swipe across over to a black and white filter and you have the it's not going to show up very well you have the picture in black and white so the value of the yarn that you're looking at is going to show up in a gray tone. So the stronger color value is going to be darker gray. It's going to be closer to black or even black itself. And then the lighter the color value, it's going to be closer to white. So it, this takes away the hue and lets you just see the color value when you take the picture and you convert it to black and white. So you can see I've got light and dark. I've got light and dark in the photo as well. Hopefully that shows up. If you go read that blog post, I um, you can see it a lot easier in the photos that I have in the blog post. So that's how you choose colors for color work. Please go read the blog post as well because that has a lot of um, really good information in it too. The next question is, do I knit with others living near me? Sadly, no. I live in a very small town in a rather rural area. Uh, the nearest yarn shop to me is maybe a couple of hours. I don't think there's one in Idaho Falls anymore, but I could be wrong. Um, so yeah, the nearest yarn shop to me is quite a distance. I do all of my shopping for yarn online. That also means that you know I can't go to a yarn shop for a knitting night. Um, there's no local knit group. Um, I don't have the time or energy or desire to start one. So I don't knit with people near me. I don't have a uh, knitting group here. 
so I just knit with people on the internet. Uh, one of the favorite ways for me to relax and feel, you know, that I'm kind of part of a community is I'll knit while I watch knitting podcasts and that's really enjoyable for me since I don't have an in real life knitting group. So this is kind of like, this is my knitting group right here while I talk to my camera in a room by myself. So maybe Sunday, but not right now. The next question is another meaty question. I thought we were going to have a short episode, but no. The next one is short row shaping and placement. So there are, we, there's the other one. Short rows, in case you don't know, short rows are put into the back of a sweater to raise the back neck. Because when you look at your body, your back neck comes up higher than your front neck. And even if you just, like here we go, back and front, you can see the height difference there. So you want the sweater to be taller in the back so that it fits properly in the back, but you don't want it super high. You don't want it the same height in the front because then it's, you know, strangling you halfway up your neck. So the short rows are used to make the back of the yoke higher so that it fits comfortably on your neck. You can see them pretty clearly in most color work yoke sweaters. It's this dark wedge here in the back of the neck and it's not in the front. Usually it's put immediately after the neck band before you begin the color work yoke. However, I started messing around with it and in this sweater, this is the back, instead of putting it in right underneath the neckline and having that big block of main color just sitting there, I decided to put them down below the color work so they're here instead of up here. Now I really like this so I'm going to probably change this to my default going forward if I can. If I'm making a sweater like I intend to make this one so that the color work continues on the body and the sleeves a little bit. So this one is going to have to have the short rows up immediately after the neckline. But for yokes like this one that the color work ends somewhere in the yoke before the sleeve separation, I think I'm going to switch to the default of putting it down here because it still fits really nice but I really like how the color work is uninterrupted around the neckline. I really like that. I really, really like that. So there's two options there. You can put them immediately after the neckline, right before the color work, or you can put them down below the color work before you split the sleeves. How I do it is you will notice in my sweaters, the beginning of the round is at the center back. It's easier to see the beginning of the round here. You can see the little jog in color there. The beginning of the round is at the center back. So I take my total stitch count and I divide it in half. So that's like if I took the sweater and I fold it flat in half like this, I have the number for this side and the number for this side. Then I take that and I divide it in half again. And that gives me the number from here over up to here. So that determines where my first turn goes. So I put it over here. So it's a quarter of the way around from the beginning of the round because the beginning of the round is at the center back. If you have the beginning of the round somewhere else, like at a shoulder, then your math is going to be different. But my, I put mine in the center back. In some of my older patterns, it's not in the center back, but now it's in the center back. So this is 25% of the stitches, a quarter of the stitches between the center back and my first turn. And then I, it's different for each sweater. I first calculate how many rows are gonna give me about two inches. So I uh, do about two inches worth of short rows and then I figure out, you know, what's this distance between the center of the back and my first short row turn. And then you have to determine how many stitches between each short row turn versus how many, because. Every sweater has a different number of stitches in this section between these two areas on my fingers. And you have to do a different number of short row turns because you have different row gauge. 
So you have to reconfigure that math on every single one of how many stitches between each short row turn to get the number of short rows you need before you come all the way back over here. So I start far away and I come back to the beginning of the round. And then, um, yeah, that's the math on that. But you can put them right after the neckline or the math is the exact same if I put them down underneath, except you have more knitting during this section because you're starting in the center back here and you're going way over here to the outside of the arm and then you work them over this section. I was really worried when I moved to this method of putting them underneath the color work that it would make the sleeve, since I have short rows, I'm on the back, right? No, this is the back, showing you. I have short rows worked across the back of the sleeve, but there are no short rows worked across the front of the sleeve. So I was a little bit worried that putting the short rows down here would make the sleeve fit wonky. When you came down to the bottom of the sleeve, because I thought maybe it will push the sleeve down instead of the yoke up, but that didn't happen. It pushes the yoke up and the sleeve fits perfectly normal. So that is the short row shaping and placement. My battery is now telling me that it's almost dead. Okay. Um, the last, I have four minutes left before this section runs out. Maybe I can talk enough in four minutes. The next question is young adult sweater with a Nordic yoke for an 18 year old son. Personally, I consider almost all of my designs to be entirely gender neutral. So any of my color work sweaters, I think would work for a young man. But if you don't like any of mine, um, you can get on Ravelry and do a, um, do a search for them. I haven't done a, I don't use Ravelry a lot as a user. I put my patterns on it and I run my test knits through it, but I don't use it a lot as, as a user. If that makes any sense at all. You could browse through Ravelry. Um, I think Brooklyn Tweed has a lot of really nice patterns for young men, but I can't think they don't do a lot of color work anymore. I think Isolde has some good color work designs that um, work well for both men and women. Um, I think I'll probably just message you on Instagram and um, tomorrow when my freeze period is off um, and and try to chat with you more about what you want because this is kind of a hard question to answer in a podcast I'm trying to think of a good sweater to recommend and I can't really come up with any exact ones but I have a lot of color work yoke sweaters that I think would work perfectly for a young man so you can look at mine um, so that's all of the questions that was a lot of questions and this is a very long episode thank you very much for sticking it out to here to the end um hopefully that answers all of your questions and if you have any further questions you can always comment or message me and let me know uh this is a lot of fun answering questions on my podcast so i think i'll do this every time hopefully you enjoyed it as well if you really hated it you can tell me or if you really loved it you can tell me so Please like this video, comment on the video, and subscribe to my channel. That really helps my content do well. The YouTube algorithm really likes it when people interact with my videos. And if you like my designs and you want to know everything that's going on, please sign up for my email newsletter at the link in the description box because that's the best place to be to be alerted when I have new patterns coming out. I don't, um, I don't really have time to create individual videos on YouTube every time I put out a new sweater. So if you're interested in knowing every time I release a new sweater, and if you want to have a discount on new patterns, then please do sign up for my email newsletter. 
and you will get a coupon code first thing for 20% off of your first purchase. And I'm gonna go knit because I need to knit three inches a day and I've only knit an inch and a quarter so far today. So I have a lot of knitting to do today. And I'm gonna go work on editing and uploading this podcast and knit to my heart's content. Thank you so much for coming and watching and listening to me talk for a really, 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 really long time today about knitting. So until next time, happy knitting. Bye.